So I'd like to introduce my new friend, Jeff Olson. Um, if Jeff hadn't had a profound mystical experience or experiences, then I still would have invited him to come because his story is so incredible. And it was, it's very um, synchronous, how do you say it, that the people who shared were talking about grief and pain and illness. Because the reason I would have asked Jeff in any case was because he survived something that I think most people would have been driven to alcohol or drugs. But he's the happiest man alive. So I'm not going to say anything else, but introduce him. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Okay, good. I'll bring the volume up. I don't have a big, powerful voice. What an honor to be here. I mean, what a beautiful, beautiful place. And last night, I slept through the eclipse, ironically. But I took time to look at the moon, the big super moon before the eclipse happened, and the light you know, the light that uh, illuminated off that sphere in such a way that um, it was so bright. It was so bright. I thought about that as I was dozing off. In fact, I was laying on the bed and I'd opened the curtain a little bit so I could see the moon. And I thought, I'll intuitively wake up, you know, when the eclipse comes. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll know it's coming. Of course, after, you know, 20 some odd hours of travel and jet lag, it didn't happen. I slept right through it. But looking at the light and realizing it's simply reflecting light from the source. And yet it is so bright that you would swear that moon was literally filled with light in such a way that was uh, so powerful. And what a, what, a, uh, what a special community this is. We had dinner last night. I'd just gotten off the plane and to sit down and, and eat with everyone and just share that moment. And the sharing this morning as well. When we share... We open up a space. In fact, you open up a sacred space. And every time I come to speak somewhere like this, it's always a brand new experience. I have to admit, I get a little bit nervous because I'm not sure what's going to happen. When I go into my experience and the things that have happened, I literally go there. Sometimes I get emotional. But what I know is that it opens up a place where Literally, angels come. And people get their own answers to whatever they're dealing with in their lives. And uh, be, be aware of that. Be aware of that. Be aware of the synchronicity of life. Did anyone else hear the geese last night? Down by the, yeah. I, I was also dozing off. And I thought, what the hell is that noise? What is all that, you know, what a... And I realized it was geese. Beautiful. Beautiful. And there's just a synchronicity to life. There's a way that things work. There's a way that things connect. There's a way that if you see it, there's miracles in absolutely everything around us. I call it uh, energy. Energy. Energy is everything. And everything is energy. There's no, there's no space between us. And thank you uh, for having us stand up and connect. It appears that there's space between us, but we're actually far more connected than you could ever imagine. But this energy, as I call it, is, is everywhere, and it does everything, and often energy moves. You realize that energy moves, and energy in motion becomes emotion. I'm not a scientist, but I'm doing my best, Evan. <laughs> and when energy's in motion, things come up. Now, what's interesting is humankind. Um, we're all so different, and yet we're so much the same. You know, we come from different parts of the country. We have different cultures, different belief systems, different upbringings, different jobs. But the one thing that's absolutely universal in humankind is our emotions the way we feel. I don't care where you are or where you come from or who you are, everyone knows love. 
Every living being knows pain. Every living being knows joy. Every living being knows sorrow. We know how we feel. It literally connects us. It's instinctive. It's actually part of our instincts. When we're born, we literally uh, learn to talk. We learn to walk. But almost from the womb, we feel. We'll hear something or see something, and we have a natural instinctive reaction to it. It's part of who we are. I... uh, I have a friend that's blind, actually. And when I showed this slide, he laughed. He said, you said we all naturally see or hear things. He said, I've been blind from birth. But my does he see, boy, does he see. He really does see, and it's instinctive. It's that inner, that inner part. And we'll have, a, we'll have something come up, and we can't help but react to it. You know, we see it, we react, we feel instinct. So be in touch this weekend and this week as we go forward with your feelings, how you feel. The feelings are the voice of spirit. That's how it works. And you'll see things and you'll feel a movement. You'll feel that emotion. You'll feel that energy. I still remember seeing this first image. Came home from school. Mom had bought the National Geographic so that I could do school reports, and that was the first time I remember feeling something, feeling something, just looking into the eyes of someone else. That was a beautiful experience this morning as well. I remember sneaking into my big brother's room to look at Abbey Road, and you know, part of the energy was I wasn't supposed to be in there. I was into his things, and I knew, but, but the, these feelings, these things you feel, and then it becomes part of pop culture, and, and we just are grounded that way. But be open to your feelings. Be open to that. I, just, I invite you to really be open. Now, as I share, I'm going to talk for about an hour this morning. We're going to have a break. But as you feel things, jot them down or take a mental note. We want to have a conversation. To me, the conversation and the dialogue is far more interesting than the monologue. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself moving forward, and we'll go there. But as we do this, remember the synchronicity to all things that happen. Remember what that is. And, and, and this is a great place to be in touch with that. It has very little to do with our brain. You know, I, I tend to get analytical at times. But there's that deeper part of us. There's that deeper part that is the heart the soul, it's that uh, innerness that becomes very, very powerful. So if we can stay engaged with that, that will serve us well. I'm going to start my story giving you some background, beginning with um, a very sacred place. If you have places in your life that are special, that are sacred, that are personal, Mine begins at a little uh, stretch of highway, about two hours north of Las Vegas, Nevada, at this mile marker, mile marker 80. Interesting, you want eight hugs a day. You know, the eight, if it's turned to its side, is infinity, and it's that give and take, that beautiful flow that is life. But mile marker 80 became a sacred space for me for a couple of reasons. This is where my accident originally happened. Now, I avoided this area for years. And what had happened to me, I didn't talk about. I had only told personal family members about it. And through an interesting chain of events, I was drawn back to this place uh, almost 13 years after the fact. And what had happened is I had had a publisher approach me and say, will you please tell your story? I had shared it in a couple little settings, only it was the first time I ever shared it publicly, and there was a publisher in the audience who came up and said, you've got to write a book. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And and, uh, he's got a little bug here. There we go. Um, (laughs) He likes me. (laughs) Angels, that's right, they've flown right in. But I went back to Mile Marker 80 when this publisher presented this contract of writing a book and everything else, and I really was quite reluctant to do it. Um, There was a few barriers. Number one, I didn't want people to think I was crazy. Number two, 
it was sacred to me. It was very, very personal stuff. And then number three, I was concerned, what if the book did well? And was I that guy who would capitalize or monetize the catastrophe that took half my family and, and I was driving the car? But I went back to this place and I asked, am I meant to tell my story? Am I rent, meant to write this book? And I got a profound answer. I call it the voice that speaks to your heart. You know, it's like you hear it, but you hear it in that inner sanctuary. And I can actually quote what I was told. When that voice speaks to my heart, it's so profound, I can quote it. it, it it's like holy scripture to me. But as I asked, I was told, share your experience. Share your experience. And if you do, people will heal. And they'll get their own answers. So I embarked on writing the book and, uh, and put it out there. Now that was an interesting process as well. I'm not a writer. I don't fancy myself a writer. I don't even type. I'm a two finger hunt and peck type of guy. But as I poured my heart out on the pages and then submitted those to the, the publisher, it was quite healing to do that, to tell the story. Our stories are so important. I, I love that we share up front and, and allow people to come up and just share their stories because in many ways it's what it connects us. Otherwise, how would we know, right? But uh, the book released and I figured my mother would buy a copy. You know, I had no expectations of what any of it would look like. And uh, the book jumped up into the top 10 in the category on Amazon, stayed there for almost two years. And, and uh, now here I am in Findhorn, Scotland, talking about it. But let me give you a little bit of background. I, um, I have a very normal life. That's me in the middle. I uh, have two brothers, one older, one younger. And when I was a little boy, mom and dad got divorced. And I was only about three and a half, four years old. And this uh, caused some real insecurities in me. You know, what was going to be good and true and forever suddenly was not. And it put me in a place where I had a hard time trusting. I felt it was my fault. I had this overwhelming sense that I'm not enough. Could never be enough. Grew up on a little farm in the Rocky Mountains of Utah in a place called Charleston. I bet nobody's ever heard of it. Population about 68. <laughs> Lots of cows, very few people. But we had horses and cows and brothers and I actually lived with my single father. I'd I had gone with my mother early on in life and then ended up moving back up with dad on the farm full time and it was a rough and tumble lifestyle. We had a lot of fun. We. Uh, didn't have a lot of softness in our lives. My father was single as well, so it was a father and three boys on a big ranch and, and farm operation, and that's, uh, that's how we grew up. What kept us out of trouble was, uh, was sports. Um, I was a rodeo cowboy for a short time during high school and uh, did a lot of things, wrestled, played football, and ended up um, really going the football way. In fact, I got a scholarship to play football at the collegiate level, at university. And um, in that whole process, I'd become very close to my brothers. My older brother was uh, my mentor. He had become a father figure through the young, early years of the divorce. My younger brother was my best buddy. I mean, we shared a room. You know, we, we slept in the same room all the way through elementary school through high school, even in college, we were roommates, and I was very, very close to my brothers. But in college, the most important and beautiful thing I did was I fell absolutely head over heels, madly, madly in love. And I wanna to touch on this for a moment since we've talked about energy. I was only 21, I was a young man, and this young lady came walking into the room I had never seen her before. I did not know her name. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. And it wasn't just love at first sight. I mean, it was that inner knowing. It was like, bam, there she is. And it startled me. 
I mean, I was shy and, and I didn't know what to say and yet here this woman came in and I had this profound connection without even knowing her name. Well, the miracle of the whole thing is I did introduce myself and we began to, uh, to talk and became friends which turned into a relationship which turned into a courtship which turned into a marriage. And uh, then our first child came along. Spencer. And we were married for about three years before Spencer came, and he was such a great kid. You know, he was one of those easy kids. I mean, slept through the night, you know, would play quietly and draw pictures, and was really, really a a, a great kid. We had so much uh, fun with him, and he became very, very close to his mother. In fact, uh, my wife's name was Tamara Spencer. We took her surname and gave it to Spencer as his first name. So her maiden name was, was uh, our first son's given name. And they had a great relationship. Tamara had had some complications, so getting another child was not easy. You know, I mean, we, we, uh, we wanted more children, but she had had endometriosis and a partial hysterectomy. It just wasn't an automatic thing. And so it was just the three of us for six years until... Uh, until little Griffin came along. And he was a miracle boy. We didn't think we would have more children, and yet he came, and what a bundle of joy he was. And yet, as Spencer was such a good baby, (laughs) Griffin was 180 degrees opposite. He was up all night, you know, screaming all the time into everything, and uh, all boy. All boy. We used to laugh uh, when it came time to change his diaper, it almost took two of us, you know, he wanted to wrestle and fight and play around and it got to the point where Tamara just said, look, you do it, you guys go have your wrestling match, get him cleaned up and bring him back and I would do that. This is a uh, particularly tender photo. Um, Spencer had got a little toy camera at Christmas time that took real pictures. And he was running about the house one morning as the family was getting ready to go. Tamara taught school. She's a school teacher. She taught in high school, you know, kids 16 to 18 years old, and and she really loved those kids. In fact, when we had our own children, she contemplated, well, maybe I should just come home and quit my teaching job. But she said to me at one point, I don't have one or two sons. I have 150 sons and 150 daughters, all those kids at school. And uh, they were getting ready to go to school one morning and Spencer was running around with his little camera and he snapped this, uh, this photograph. And it was not long after that that we, uh, we took a trip. We went to southern Utah, the big red arches. You've probably seen them on postcards and everywhere else. Utah's a beautiful place because in a very short distance. Uh, the geography changes so drastically. I live in the mountains where it's, you know, alpine forests and pine trees, and we get snow in meters there, not in inches. But you drive for three hours south, and all of a sudden you're in the desert, the red rocks and arches and all those beautiful formations. And we were taking Easter weekend to go visit uh, Tamara's parents and grandparents. Her grandfather had Alzheimer's disease. He was not doing well. Uh, he, was, he had lost his memory. He was in a care center. His health was failing. And we had gotten that phone call saying, well, you might want to come see Grandpa. We don't know how long he's going to be around. In fact, her parents had moved there and had a little condominium just so they could look after Granddad and be near him. So we packed everybody up and drove the four hours, it was a four hour trip to, uh, to St. George and spend Easter weekend there and it was a beautiful weekend. We had a tradition of dyeing Easter eggs, coloring the eggs, you know, we would hard boil them and color them and we did that with the kids and then put them to bed and I went out late that night and, and hid the eggs. The kids would get up on Easter morning and go hunt for the Easter eggs. We made Easter baskets, you know, and went to the store and got little trinkets and toys for each of the kids and put it in the baskets. And we spent that evening kind of hiding them and putting the baskets up in a tree. I wanted, Spencer was seven years old at the time. I wanted it to be a challenge. He didn't care about the hard boiled eggs. He wanted the baskets. So we hid the baskets in a tree. 
Now Griffin, on the other hand, who was just, he was just learning to walk. And he was just saying his first words. He was 14 months old. He was all about the colored eggs. And as they got up that morning, he was toddling about and, you know, tripping and falling and getting up. And then he would crawl and then he would lift himself up a little bit. But he would find the colored eggs and he would bring them to me. And he would say, Dad, ball. He thought they were balls. We had a beautiful Easter celebration. We were meant to go home that night and make the drive back, but we were having such a good time, we decided to stay. So I left messages with the guys at work saying, hey, I'll be there on Monday. I'll get there as quickly as I can. Monday morning came. Of course, Grandma had breakfast. You know, she wanted us to stay and visit more. We had breakfast. We talked. And it really was getting late, and I knew we had to get in the car and get on our way. And it was about, oh, 10.30 in the morning, 11, four-hour drive. I said, we better, we better get on our way. So we hugged everybody, loaded up the car, put everybody in their seat belts, and I was just getting ready to pull away from their place, just putting the car in drive. And Tamara stopped me. She said, wait just one second. She said, I want to go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. Now, in that moment, I, I thought, women, you know, we've hugged, we've said goodbye, I'm late for work. But I bring this up for a very specific reason. It's that energy, it's that intuition, it's that inner knowing. I want to just go say goodbye to mom and dad one more time. And I put the car in park, and I watched as she got out. And there was grandma and grandpa, her mother and father on the porch, waving as they do. And she ran up and I watched as she hugged them and also kissed them. She kissed them each. And I noticed that. I noticed that. And then she came bounding back to the car and uh, hopped in and we buckled up and away we went. You know, I put the car in drive and hit the interstate, put it up on 75 miles an hour and set the cruise control. That was as fast as I could legally go and I wanted to get back home. I knew there was a million things happening at work. You know, we had a big photo shoot the next day and I was coordinating several items and I was thinking about all the people I had to call and, you know, it's that to-do list, that chatterbox. It just goes on in your head. It's that brain that just, all the things. And I was racing up the freeway, thinking about everything that would take place and I happened to just look in the rearview mirror. And when I did, I saw Griffin, my youngest son, just sitting in his car seat. And he had fallen sound asleep. But something happened when I looked in that rearview mirror and all that chatter was going on in my head and I saw my little boy and all of that energy just kind of settled right down here. And I, I felt him. I just, I felt that connection for just a moment. But I noticed things. I noticed his fingernails and the way his hands were set up on the car seat and I noticed how long his eyelashes were. And I thought, what a beautiful, miracle boy. Never knew we were going to get another child and there he was, sound asleep, sleeping in the car seat and I just focused behind me on Spencer who was playing with Star Wars action figures he had gotten in his Easter basket. And he was making all the sound effects of you know, the grandest lightsaber battle in the universe. And I felt him. And I thought, what a, what, a good, what a good child. I mean, he'd never been a moment of trouble. It was so much fun to be around. And then I looked over at Tamara, who had also reclined her seat, and she was sound asleep too. Her and Griffin were both sound asleep. Except she was still holding on to my hand. So I was driving with the left, and she was holding on to my right. And I felt her. I was overcome with what she meant in my life. I mean, she'd been such a light and such an anchor. I and mean, she wrangled the kids, she wrangled her own career, she wrangled me at the same time. And she was such a beautiful woman, a beautiful, powerful soul. And I noticed how she held onto my hand. She only held onto three fingers. I don't know why she did it that way. 
from the second date we ever went on, and she took hold of my hand, she held on to three fingers, and she had held it that way ever since, and now we'd been married 10 years, and she was still holding my hand the same way, but sound asleep in her, car, in her seat. I'm driving the car, and I'm just feeling this absolute gratitude. It was an absolute moment of gratitude for, for what I had, for what I was surrounded with. And it was about an hour after that, and I'm not positive what happened. There was reports of crosswinds that were severe, blowing over 100 miles an hour. There was reports of a red truck that was driving erratically on the interstate and cutting people off. The most disconcerting part of the story is what I believe may have happened is I may have dozed off at the wheel for just a moment, just, just, just briefly. But we swerved to the right, and I overcorrected to the left, and the car began to roll, not off the road, but down the road at 75 miles an hour. And I blacked out for most of that. It was a horrific accident. At that speed, they say the car probably rolled no less than six or eight times. <clears throat> I was completely conscious when the car came to the stop, however. I knew that the car had stopped. I knew we had had an accident. And the first thing I consciously heard was my son Spencer, my seven-year-old, crying in the back seat. Now, as a father, I thought, oh, good, he's okay. I've got to get to him. I've got to get to him. And that's when I realized I could not move. I was pinned either to the seat or the floorboard. I, I could not tell. I was having trouble seeing. I couldn't breathe very well. But I had this child crying, and I wanted to get to him. Now, I didn't realize it in that moment, but what had happened is both of my legs had been shattered and crushed. Um, the left leg was amputated above the knee. My back had actually been broken, but the spinal column had not been damaged. My right arm had almost been torn off. It had a really bad laceration under it, and then there was no muscle through the entire rotator cuff even attaching it anymore, so it was immobile. And then the... Uh, the seat belt had cut through my midsection and had ruptured all my intestines and my rib cage had become crushed and my lungs were collapsing. Now, I didn't know any of that. All I knew is I had a little boy crying and I had to get to him. And that's when the brutal reality hit that nobody else was crying. I couldn't hear the baby, Griffin, and and I knew in that moment that Tamara was gone as well. In fact, I not only realized it, I, I felt it. I felt it. I knew, I knew that they had passed and they were killed instantly at the scene of the accident. As I continued to try to comfort Spencer, and this is the worst kind of a hell a man could ever be in. I mean, here I've got a child crying in the back seat of the car. I'm losing my consciousness. Half the family's passed. I was driving, the guilt, the remorse, the regret, the panic, the horror, and I said to Spencer, I couldn't talk very well because I was, my lungs were collapsing, but I was able to say to him, it's going to be okay. And my last conscious thought was great. My last words to my son are a lie because it's not okay. It's really not okay. And in all that panic, and chaos and, and absolute mayhem. I began to have a strange thing happen. Now words can't describe what that was like to be in the car and know all that had taken place and realizing I couldn't get to my son and the absolute panic of all that. But in it, suddenly there was a sense of calmness. I want you to get a grip on the contrast there because that moment and then all of a sudden this calmness, it was strange. And it felt as if I was surrounded by light. In fact, it felt like a bubble of light. It felt like something just came around me. And I actually felt as if I began to rise above the scene of the accident, which was strange and startling. And yet it was nice to not feel all that mayhem and as I became aware that I was literally okay in this light, 
I realized that Tamara, my wife who I knew was deceased at the scene, was also there with me. And she was okay, except she was very upset about me being there. She said, no, 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 you've gotta go. You've gotta go back, you've gotta go back, you can't come, you've gotta go back. We had this intense conversation, even in the calmness, about the fact that I, I couldn't leave our son in the back seat of that car. Now, I learned a lot about choice in that moment. And I've learned that life is nothing but a series of choices, just moment to moment to moment. But here I was looking at the, the woman I loved more than life and wanting to stay in this calmness based on what had happened. But I knew I had that little boy crying in the back seat of the car. It was time to make a choice. And as soon as I made the conscious thought I mean, we have no idea how powerful our thoughts are. As soon as I made the conscious thought, I've got to go back. I've got to go back, then boom. I was away from the bubble, said the most poignant goodbye I would ever say, and I found myself wandering around a hospital. Now, I have no concept of time in that bubble of light. I don't know how long it took. I don't know how many minutes or hours or what took place. What, what I later found out is people had arrived at the scene of the accident. One of them was a doctor who was able to do some emergency things for me, was able to take care of my son Spencer, who was not badly injured physically. He was banged up. But emotionally, he thought he'd lost his whole family. And this good man was able to, to take care of us in a way. They rushed us to a little local hospital. They knew they could do nothing for me. So they put us on life flight to life flight us into uh, Salt Lake City where I could be seen to. And they, they brought Spencer with me. He was taken to a children's hospital and I was taken to an adult hospital. But I had no concept of any of that. All I knew is I had wrecked the car. I said the most poignant goodbye I would ever say and then I found myself wandering around this hospital. And everyone I saw, the connection. There's no accidents we did that this morning, and I didn't ask for that, but the connection. Everyone I saw, I knew them absolutely perfectly. I knew everything about them. I knew their love, their hate, their joy, their pain. I knew their choices, their decisions. I knew everything about all of their life, almost as if it was my own. I knew them as well as I knew myself, and I felt that same intense love for them that I'd been experiencing in the car with my own family. Everybody from the heroin addict, you know, to the saintly grandmother, the doctors, the nurses, I, I had insights to things that had happened to them. There was one particular nurse and I, I absolutely felt her abuse as if it had happened to me. I absolutely felt what that had done to her psyche. I absolutely, I knew it. It was as if I was them and they were me. We were so connected. There was a oneness that I can't even put words to, but we were so connected. Now, I'd grown up in a Christian home. I actually had a Bible verse come up in this whole episode, which was the classic verse that said, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me which I used to think was a nice verse about being kind to people. What I didn't realize was the connection. You know, the connection. Wow, they are me. I am them. And the teacher who said that, you know, knew he was no greater than the man in prison or the naked beggar on the street because we were all actually one, literally connected. And I was experiencing that, looking at every soul and having this overwhelming, unconditional love for them. Unconditional love. I, I wanted to embrace them, each and every one of them. And I was wandering about the hospital experiencing this and finally came upon a man lying on a bed that I didn't feel anything from, which I found odd because of the overwhelming love and sense of, of, of everyone else around me. So I stepped closer to take a look only to realize that was me, or that was my body. They're laying on the bed. I was, this was me. 
And it was absolutely profound. I mean, the love I was experiencing was profound, and yet there was my vehicle. You know, there was the body. There was where I had taken on this life. And I also knew I had to get back in. Had to get back in the body. Now, once again, it was as quick as a conscious thought. And I looked and contemplated, oh, it was so broken. Um, There was this overwhelming sense of sadness. I realized how much I'd taken for granted. You know, I'd been a Division I athlete, and now it was, I mean, it was just a mess. But as soon as I made the conscious thought to go back in the body, it was that quick. Boom, then I was back in the body. And it wasn't like I went and laid down or, I mean, it was like stepping from one door to the next. It was, as, it was, as, it was a very graceful shift. And I, I bring that up too because having experienced that, uh, passing is a beautiful thing. I, uh, I used to fear death a little bit. Now I kind of look forward to it. It was a beautiful, graceful, natural transition in the body, out of the body, and it was as much as a conscious thought, being in the body. But then I was back into all the pain, the suffering, the grief, the guilt, the regret, the remorse, the panic of all of it. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't speak. I was ventilated. They had a respirator in me for the lungs. Uh, my legs were obviously immobile. My right arm was immobile. They had left all the wounds in my midsection open because of the severe infections. I was running a temperature of 106 to 108. They had me on ice beds. It was, I, I was in a very, very bad way. They eventually toured, uh, tied down my left arm because I kept trying to tear out all the, all the medical equipment. So they tied that down. And there I laid. Um, I was in ICU for three months. And I really couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't get up and run. I couldn't get up and, I, I mean, I, I couldn't shout. I couldn't, I mean, I, had, I, I, I gained a whole new learning of what it means to be still, to literally be still and go within. And I had interesting experiences. It's almost as if I had one foot in this realm and one foot in the next the, the whole time. Uh, I'll, I'll share one in particular. I was, I was having these interesting conversations with my deceased wife, Tamara, still. Um, I would be in all the pain and suffering in the hospital, and it was as if I stepped into the other realm, and there she would be, and we would talk. Trivial things, almost, it seemed. I mean, she she wanted her cousin to have her favorite ring, and she wanted her niece to have another favorite piece of jewelry, and she wanted her sister-in-laws to have the party dresses, and she wanted to be buried with Griffin in her arms near our home so that Spencer, our surviving son, would have a place to be and feel close to mom. And I was having all this take place. Now, what I didn't know was the families were in turmoil. I mean, you can imagine what that would be like. And our families got along splendidly, but two of us were gone. They were trying to plan a funeral. Tamara's family wanted to take them back down to St. George and bury them on a family plot they had in southern Utah. The doctors were telling my family I probably was not going to make it. So my family was saying, well, yeah, but if Jeff dies, shouldn't we bury them together? And we're not sure that they want to, you know, we, what about Spencer? Can you really take everybody four or five hours away? And there was all this turmoil. Decisions had to be made. And, and you don't get a lot of time, Right. I bring this up for a specific reason because it was interesting. During that time, I was also having an insurance issue. We have health insurance in the United States where the health insurance kind of dictates where your care should be given. And I had been life flighted to a hospital that was not in my insurance network. And so the insurance company was upset about we would need to transfer me into a different hospital. Now, my older brother, who had uh, he'd become a law enforcement officer, he was a trained EMT and all kinds of things, he was angry. He says, you can't move him. You can't transfer him. My younger brother had become a, a, a lawyer, an attorney. You call it a barrister, I believe. Anyway, he wanted to sue the hospital, the insurance company, everybody else. He was upset about it. But in the end, the insurance company won out. And... 
I was transferred, but here's the miracle. In that process, they briefly removed the ventilator. And I was able to speak, not very well, but I was able to speak. I was able to share with key family members, gosh, I've been having the craziest conversations. Tamara wants to be buried near our home. She wants the baby in her arms. She even let me know um, what song she wanted sung at her services. Ironically, it was a little Celtic song. It was about a lark that could only sing one song and it lived within my heart. All this information was shared. Now, the reason I bring this up is everybody thought it was absolutely falling apart. You know, how could the insurance company do this? What an absolute catastrophe. And yet it was not falling apart. It was literally falling into place. Because had that not happened, they would not have removed the ventilator. I wouldn't have been able to share these brief key pieces of information. And things would have been a lot different. The hospital stay went on for almost six months. I kept throwing pulmonary ambulisms, their blood clots that would lodge in my lungs. I would go from ICU to surgical recovery, back into ICU. They would do the life saving surgeries first and then wait for me to get a little more healthy. But eventually I began to stabilize. I began to get well. I began to heal. And actually, um, one of the most profound experiences in the whole episode was at the end of my hospital stay. I'd been there almost six months. I was out of ICU. I was out of surgical recovery. I was actually in the rehabilitation wing. They had just been working on my shoulder They were doing some strange shock treatment to see if the nerves were regenerating into the muscles at all. And it was at that time that I had a profound dream, if you will, or vision. I was finally sleeping on my side. I had laid on my back for so long that I'd rubbed the back of my head bald. And and my brothers were there. They had been there day and night. I mean, they almost lost their jobs to come and be with me and stay with me and cry with me. And my younger brother was there this night and he said, I'll just lay with you till you fall asleep. That was still the hardest time. Nighttime was the hardest time to to lay down and still just kind of deal with it all. I laid down and I turned on my side. I was finally able to sleep on my side. They had stabilized my you know, my abdominal issues. And I went into a deep sleep. I went into a very peaceful sleep. But during the sleep is when I felt that same light, that same bubble, that same rise. And as I felt that, I knew the feeling. I'm like, oh my goodness, here's that feeling, that calm, that peace. And yet as I rose up, this time the bubble went away. And there was no one there with me. I was by myself, but I was in a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And I began to walk. And then I began to run. And I was running. And the experience was so physical. Here's the strange thing. It was so physical. I could feel the ground under my feet. You know, I could feel the energy fire up through my foot, into my calf, into my thigh muscle, and I was running, feeling everything in a very, very physical way, but in, in a super sensory way, um, far more powerful than anything I had experienced in this realm. And I was running about just joyfully being home. I knew it was home. I mean, it felt so familiar, so welcoming, so embracing. It felt like home. People say heaven, whatever word you want to put on it. The only word I could place was this was home. And I was running about joyfully and I also got the message that I wasn't there to stay. And about that time, there was this corridor off to my left and I knew intuitively I was to go down the corridor. So I raced down the corridor and as I made my way down it, I realized there was a crib at the end of the corridor there. And I made my way to the crib and when I looked in, There was my little griffin sleeping 
as peacefully as he had been in the back seat of the car when I looked in the rearview mirror. And I just marveled. I, 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 just, I picked him up, and that was very physical, too. I could feel him against my body. I could feel the heat of his body. I could feel his rib cage expanding with breath. I could feel his breath on my neck. I could feel his soft head on my face, and I just stood there marveling, holding my little boy and thinking, do I really get to say goodbye to him, too? Now, I hesitated for years to share any of this because I know so many lose loved ones and they don't get to say goodbye. And I was in such gratitude thinking, I'm really here holding him and he's really okay. And I know I was experiencing him as that little child because that was for me. You know, any, any near-death experience or mystical experience or out-of-body experience, the universe speaks to us in the language that we'll understand. Even if it doesn't make sense, they know that our heart will get it. And in this instance, I was holding my little boy in a very physical way. And as I did, I felt someone come up behind me. Now, this was so overwhelming, I didn't even dare turn around. What I felt was so cosmic and so powerful and so profound and so wise and yet also so absolutely personal it startled me at first. There I was holding my son and feeling this presence come up. I, I knew I was in the presence of God. Not, nothing short of that. It was so overwhelming. And the interesting thing is I had this moment where I thought, oh, oh no. I hope he forgives me. And what I felt as I held my little boy was this divine being come up and wrap those arms around me and hold me. And the clear message was there's nothing to forgive. Nothing but love. Absolute, unconditional love just poured through me. And I felt almost as if my son became part of me and I became part of God and then we all became part of everything there is. It was almost like an inhale of breath and an exhale of bam. I was, I, I, I was everything. I was all of it. And again, from my upbringing, the words, I am that I am, became very, very meaningful to me because I was experiencing I am that I am. And knowledge just poured through. I saw my whole life you know, I saw the divorce, I saw the insecurities it had created. I was unaware of it until this moment. Wow, look, look what I was putting bandages on. You know, the broken hearted little boy, all that overachieving, you know, make the team, get the grade, get the girl, get the job, all of that was a big bandage to cover up that insecurity I felt from the little time that mom and dad split up. I saw my brothers, I saw how they had supported me, I saw my friends, I saw the things that I thought were mistakes. And I realized there's absolutely no mistakes. It was all in perfect order. I saw the things that I had done wrong, so to speak. And I knew they were wrong and I did them anyway. And yet in these beautiful arms, all I felt was, look how much we love you. Look how much we support you. Look how much we honor your life, your choices, your decisions, your learning. We love you. It was such an overwhelming, profound absolute unconditional love and in those arms the I am that I am I knew I was perfect and that took me years to say too but I felt this absolute perfection about my life about me and when I say that I mean all of us absolute perfection absolute order I knew that I was absolutely divine that not only was I connected to that but I came from all that and here I was here um, in my Christian upbringing, biblical terms again. You know, masters like Jesus who said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, walk on the water, Peter. Why do you doubt? You know, greater things will you do than this if you just believe and embrace. And I had this whole shift in everything I thought I knew was now completely turned upside down in such a beautiful, beautiful way all made evident by unconditional love, 
absolute unconditional love. Now, I learned about choice. I could lecture for three hours, and we're going to have time for questions, so save your questions till after the break. In those brief moments of what I learned and how it turned everything upside down, I learned a lot about choice again. In fact, what was communicated, not necessarily with words, but just with this flowing energy, was that I had a choice. I could spend my life feeling as if God had ripped them away from me, or that I crashed the car and it was my fault. I could beat myself up the rest of my life. Or in that perfect, profound moment, I was told, you have a choice. You can give your son to me, and you get to exercise your will. You can even give your wife if you would like. But then you're exercising your freedom, your will, in, in order to give them to me so that you never feel like they have to be taken away. And in that beautiful, profound peace, I was actually able to kiss my little boy, and I gave him back. And then I woke up in the hospital bed, you know, back to the amputation and the arm. Th this arm was bound up and couldn't move. This leg was in a brace straight out. It still had six pins and a plate in it. This leg had been amputated, and yet I had a whole different perspective about choice and choosing. And it's interesting to talk about the near-death experience. The more important thing is the life experience. I mean, here I was now, you know. I was going to be going back home very, very soon. And I was incredibly worried about Spencer, my seven-year-old. He had come to see me in the hospital. He had been staying with my younger brother and his wife. They had taken him in just like their own and loved him and took care of him. It was difficult because he had grieved all those months that I was not necessarily in a coma, but I was out of it. I was, I was four months behind everybody in the grief process, and he would come to see me in the hospital, and I would just cry. I couldn't, I, I mean, he would come in, and I thought, what has happened to our lives? What's going to be with me? And I would cry. He asked me at one point while I was still in the hospital, please, Daddy, don't cry anymore. I just want to watch the ball game. So I'd sit with him and hold it together while we watched the ball game. And, you know, and this was my little boy, and now I was going to be coming home. I mean, it wasn't the hospital anymore. We were going to go to the grocery store, and I would take him to school. What were people going to think of this gimpy, strange-looking father, you know? And my brothers came to get me the day I was to go home. I mean, they were right there, and they had to lift me. I couldn't, with this arm bound up, I couldn't transfer into a wheelchair or anything. They would literally have to lift me and put me in the chair. And they did so and took me to the car. And when we got home, they'd build a ramp, you know, so I could get into the house. And I could see Spencer looking out the window as they lifted me out of the car, put me in my car seat, or in my wheelchair from the car. So they lifted me out, and I could see Spencer looking at him. That must have been strange for him to watch his uncles, you know, lift his dad. I mean, I was the rough and tumble, you know, throw him in the air, tickle him all the way up the stairs, and now that was not going to be taking place anymore. And I could see him looking out. They put me in the chair. I began to make my way to the door. It was a little electric wheelchair. I could control it with my one good arm. And as I made my way, Spencer came running out the front door and ran toward me, and then he ran right past me. He just went right past me. And I thought I knew this was going to be hard. This is too much for him to see all this now here at home. I made my way toward the house and I just turned to see what he was doing. He had actually, what he actually did is he had run across the street. He was knocking on all the neighbor's doors and he was saying, come out, come out. My dad has made it home. Come out and see my dad. He made his way around, and then he came and jumped on my lap, which just about killed me, because I still had all the sutures down here from, the, from the, the surgeries on my abdomen. And he wrapped his arms around my neck. And we looked in each other's eyes for about three seconds. And I explained, it's going to be like this for a while. I said, are you going to be okay with this? And I used Star Wars terms. I said, they're going to get me a really cool Darth Vader leg, and... They'll teach me how to walk. And he said, Dad, if you were nothing but a puddle of blood, I would still love you. And we've, we've laughed about that over the years. But I had a profound realization. As I sat there in that wheelchair holding my living son in this realm, it was no less profound 
than holding my deceased son in that realm. All of a sudden, the whole veil, if you will, just vanished, and I realized heaven is right here. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to become. It's simply to be here now and be open to the miracles and to the love. And as I held my little boy and we had that exchange, that was divine. That was perfect. And that shifted a lot of things too. Life um, is interesting. I've got, I've, I've got a book out. This is the first book. You can get it on Amazon. The first book did well enough. The publisher came and said, will you do another one? Please write the follow-up. And it's beyond mile marker 80, but this is putting the pieces back together. You mean, at some point, you've got to put your pants on and go to work, right? And uh, that was an interesting process. I did learn to walk. I was going back to work. Spencer was growing up. I had hired a tutor and a nanny, and of course, my family. My mother was great. She'd come and assist me with the wash every weekend, <laughs> you know, and I'd say, Mom, I'm, I've really got it. But it set me on a spiritual journey. Everything had changed for me. You know, everything had changed. I mean, where were the answers? Where would I feel all that love that I had felt there and in those moments here? I went on quite a, quite a path of, um, oh, that's my leg. That's my good leg. That's the one good leg I have, and it's all bolted together. That's the most recent... Uh, the most recent photo, but I went on a path of just searching for all that light and love here. I looked into religions. I looked into my own religion. I decided I wasn't interested in religion. I was interested in spirituality. I was interested in that connection. I began to study energy work, you know, Reiki, um, matrix energetics, reconnective healing. Finally ran on to Native American uh, medicine men and shaman. Wednesday we'll be doing a shamanic ceremony here and I, I trust you can join me for that. But looking, 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 searching, searching, searching for the answers out there. What I had forgotten is the answers are all in here. They're all in here. When I was in those divine arms and was shown that glimpse of what really is, and when I laid in the hospital and learned that by going within, that's where all my answers truly were, miracles began to happen. Now, the grief didn't go away. I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression that I had a terrible accident, beautiful experiences, and then I was okay. No. I had a terrible accident. I had beautiful experiences, and it took 10 years. It took 10 years. Sorting through it, reliving it. And the grief would come in waves. I would be okay, and then it would be like a wave would just hit. I, one particular night, I recall, I had sent Spencer up to bed. And his bed was on the second level, and I was still dealing with the stairs. I'm still slow on stairs. I think what I was really doing was avoiding the bedroom. It was just too painful to go in there. My, my wife, Tamara, had set out a little sweater to dry, and she was going to wear it on that Monday morning to school. And I hadn't even been able to move it. I just had to leave it there. But as I watched Spencer go up to his room, I realized he's never going to remember his mom. He's never going to remember his mother. He's a little boy. He'll forget. He won't know. And the grief just hit. Now, his door shut, and I knew he was sleeping, and I finally just fell apart. I fell apart, and I laid on the floor, and I bawled and sobbed and hollered at God again, saying, how can I do this? What am I going to do? How will he ever remember? How can I ever provide a life for him? And the guilt. I was driving the car. I was sober. I was obeying the laws, but that, that still haunted me. Gosh, if I, if I dozed off at the will. And, and it just came in, 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 in huge tidal waves of grief. And as I laid there crying and screaming... I had a profound answer, that voice that speaks to the heart, but this time I audibly heard it in my ears. And it was only two words, but that same divine voice that had held me said, choose joy. Choose joy, and I remembered, oh yeah, it's a choice. I get to choose. It's up to me. I'm the creator of my experience here. I'm not acted upon. I get to choose. I get to create my experience, and things happened. There was so many angels in our lives. Um, 
family, friends. I've wondered what people do that have to do this all by themselves. You know, I had so many people around me to support me. The guys at work were great. In fact, as the years went on and I was back working and Spencer was going, the guys at work invited me to a lunch meeting. And I was reluctant to go because I said, no, 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 I don't want to do lunch. If I just work through lunch, I'll get home sooner. You forget, I'm a single dad. I got to get, get home and take care of my son. I'm paying that nanny by the hour, you know. <laughs> Let me get finished up here. And they said, no, come and go to this lunch. I went into the lunch, and a woman walked in. And I didn't even know her name. And I had an absolute deja vu, that lightning that hit that said, there she is, pay attention. Now, at that time, I thought, I need to see a psychiatrist. I mean, I really did. I thought, I need to get some professional help. I'm too broken. I'm too lonely. I'm too sad. But there was this profound deja vu. And it was a group about this big. They were serving lunch, and I sat down at the end of a table. The ironic thing is the woman came in, and there was only one chair left in the house, which was right across from me. And she sat down, and we talked, and... We became friends, and that turned into a relationship, which turned into a courtship, and then I eventually remarried. Um, Tanya is her name. You know, there's a story of, uh, of a famous potter, and they do this in, in the Eastern Bloc. They, they, they will make pots, and he would fire these beautiful pots, sculpt them, put them in a kiln, fire them, and then he would break them in pieces. And he would meticulously put the pot back together, but he'd fill all the cracks with gold and silver. And when someone asked him, why, why do you do this? Why do you take a perfectly good pot and break it, shatter it? He said, that's what gives them character. That's what makes them a masterpiece. That's what makes them an absolute one of a kind. Tanya has been a potter in our lives. She's one of those earth angels that comes in and literally puts it all back together again. She kept, uh, as, as we got serious, she said, you know, I, I don't believe I'll ever be able to have children. She said, I've had enough female issues in my adult life. The doctors have said, I probably won't conceive. And I said, that's okay, we'll just raise Spencer. She kept having impressions that we should adopt, that we should adopt children. Now this frightened me. Even with all that love I had experienced, I thought, what if I love my natural son differently than an adopted child? What, what would that look like? Um, she eventually, I came home from work one day and she said, uh, I've made an appointment with an adoption agency. She said, will you come and just meet? And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. She said, it's just an orientation. No big deal. We went and, and met with this adoption agency. And there was many couples there. They, they just walked us through the process, right? And uh, we left our name and number. We saw couples there that had no children. We actually drove home that night and said, you know what, you're right. We've got Spencer. These... these couples that have no children, they should adopt kids and we'll move on. That was a Friday. It was the following Wednesday at the office at work. I got a phone call from the adoption agency. And they said, hey, how serious are you about adopting? And I said, I don't know. Why? Well, Isaac, he was the social worker on the other line. He said, well, we have a situation here at the adoption agency. He said, a mother has come and she's got a little 14-month-old boy. Boom, my little griffin came immediately into my mind. And he had my attention. I said, okay, I understand. And he said, she's also pregnant with another little boy. And she wants the brothers to stick together. Now, that got my attention, too. I knew what it was like for brothers to stick together. Of course, by that time, I'm trying to shut the door, and I'm weeping in my office, because you know, that, that spirit, that energy had hit me and kind of said, here's where it all happens. And he said, the process is you'll need to bring your stuff down to the agency. I said, well, what stuff's that? And he said, well, you recall the orientation. You know, we showed you the beautiful portfolios, and they did where families had put, you know, histories and traditions and photographs and everything in these beautiful 
books, you know, these albums. And I said, we don't have anything like that. And uh, he said, well, if you're interested, bring something down. I called Tanya on the phone, and she said, yeah, the social worker called me too. She jotted a handwritten letter and put some snapshots in a little number 10 business envelope and took it down. And this beautiful birth mother was looking through all the portfolios and got this envelope and opened it up, and she said, this is the family, this is the one. And it wasn't long until Zach, Zachary, was in our home. And Aiden, which is a Gaelic name that means fire. I'm very tied to this country, by the way. I love it here. Aiden was going to be born. Now the social worker called and said to Tanya, would you like to come and be a part of the birth? You know, the birth mother would like you to come and be a part of that. Tanya said, oh, I'd love that. That would be beautiful. Got a call two days later. They said, we're on our way to the hospital. The birth mother's in labor. And this was a semi-open adoption. She said she'd like Jeff to be there too. I said, okay, I suppose I could do that. I'll wait in the waiting room, you know. No, they took us in. It was a birthing suite. So the birth mother was here in labor. There was a couch over by the window where I could mind my own business and go over by the couch. She went into hard labor. And, of course, Tanya's over holding her hand and feeding her ice chips, you know, and this baby's being born. And then the birth mother hollered and said, Jeff, are you coming over here? And I said, no, I'm okay. I'll just stay over here and mind my own business. And then I don't know, it's like a Hulk comes out of these little women, you know? And she looked over at me and she said, are you the father of this child or not? And I said, no, well, yes, I am. And uh, went over and the, the doctor put gloves on me. I got to catch Aiden, cut his umbilical cord and give him his first bath. And it was interesting as I gave that child to her and I had this flashbacks of giving Griffin back and forth and then eventually when she gave him to me and what that was like and to realize that connection, that love that beautiful thing this is our family uh, now this is Spencer, I wanted to touch on this this is my little seven year old boy who grew up and I'll be brief because we're at the break he never had any near-death experience. He came to me at about age 18, and he was in a rock band, and he was involved in some things that were literally landing people in jail. And he said, Dad, I think you're full of it. You've told me these beautiful stories. You've had dreams and visions and out-of-body experiences. He said, I got nothing. You know, he said, I was that little seven-year-old boy. I prayed every day, saying, God, can I see mom? Can I feel something? Can I have anything? And he said, I got nothing. So he said, I don't want to hear your story. I'm done with you, with all of that. Um, the band was breaking up. They literally had two members going to jail. There was drugs involved. He was on a very, very frightening path for a father, right? I'm like, well, how can I do this? I, I, I went home, and again, I'm on the floor crying and saying, please, God, I'll give it all away. Everything I experienced, I'll give it away if my son can have some connection, some inkling, some feeling, something, anything. And that voice that speaks to my heart was very interesting. What God told me was, how dare you judge your son? How dare you judge that little boy who would love you no matter what just because his experience isn't like yours. Don't judge his experience. He's having the perfect experience for him. You had yours, he gets his. Honor it. Love him unconditionally. Stop putting conditions on it. Stop thinking it has to look a certain way or like yours or anything else. Just love him. I learned a lot about judgment too. We get to let that go. Judgment and comparison. 
He did well. He found his own way. And it wasn't my way. And that was perfectly beautiful. But he got married three weeks ago. And uh, this is our family now. But um, Zach and Aiden are my two adopted sons. It doesn't matter how they get there. They're just my boys. Spencer's uh, going to be a teacher like his first mom. It's funny. He, he, he now says, well, when, when he finally came to himself, I want to share this just quickly. He and Tanya never got along that well. You know, she wasn't his mom. When he finally got clarity about life and what had happened, he came to us and he just hugged me and cried, which was a beautiful thing. Here was my big groany, six foot two or three now, and he's hugging me like when he was that little boy. And he said, Dad, I know it's all real. And he said, I know what I know. And that's all he said. I know what I know, and that's good enough for me. But then he turned to Tanya, his stepmom. And he began to weep. And he said, I love you. Thank you for being my mom. He said, I spent all my life looking for my mom, and you were right there. And now he says, I have two moms. I got an angelic mom, and I got this one. And they have a beautiful relationship now, but he overcame all of that stuff. All of that stuff. So it's time we look at things differently. As we go on the break, think differently about things. Think about the connection. What I've learned from my experience, and that's what I want to spend the next part of the uh, morning on, it's not so much the out-of-body or near-death experience. What I experienced was very real. It shifted a lot of things in me. But what do we do with it now? You know, what do we do with what we learned? What do we do with that love? What do we do with that unconditional love that is all there is? And how do we change things? How do we change things? See, I grew up in a belief system that, well, number one, God was going to judge me, and I was probably in trouble based on what I'd done. Number two, that there was separateness, you know, that these people had it the right way, they had it the wrong way, and we have to do it the right way or God's going to be mad. I mean, have you ever heard any of that stuff before? Okay. What I've learned is we're absolutely in it together, that God has no stepchildren or adopted children, that we're literally all God. We're all connected. We're all here, and we can change it. I also used to have a belief that it would get so bad that God would just come and fix it all. Burn it up and start over, maybe. We get to change it. We get to fix it. It will start in unconditional love. Now, this is a relatively small group of people in a beautiful, remote little corner of the world. But as we connect, as we go out in absolute unconditional love, it ripples out and it changes the whole world. It literally changes the whole world. Are you feeling a shift? Who's aware of the shift that's happening? I mean, you, you can see it in the world. There, there's turmoil. There's all kinds of things that we get to look at. But it's shifting if we'll tap into that, starting with that unconditional love and just ripple that out. Anyway, thank you for being so attentive. Um, I think we're about quarter to 11. But please write down your questions. Bring questions. Don't come back in here and not have a conversation. I, don't make me stand up here and not answer questions. So do that, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>